Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here to this very prestigious place. It's of course a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I will talk about conceptual issues in uh, quantum cosmology. So quantum cosmology is the application of quantum theory to the universe as a whole. And of course I want, want to give also some motivation for that. I mean, why should we bother with quantizing the universe as a whole? And uh, if we do, I mean, what are the problems um, that we have to face and to solve? So uh, let me start with a quote by Gelman and Hartl from 1990. So they say quantum mechanics is best and most fundamentally understood in the framework of quantum cosmology. So this is a, as a quantum cosmology does not only serve us to get an understanding of the universe as a whole, but also in their opinion to um, have a better understanding of quantum mechanics. What they mean is um, the universe is by definition a closed system. And so the interpretation of quantum theory must be given in terms of the closed system. So you cannot refer to external measurement agencies, for example. Now, why should we work, why should we deal with quantum cosmology? If we assume that quantum theory is universally valid, and I will make this um, assumption here, then we know that a system is quantum correlated to its environment, the environment to the environment, and so on. So um, the only closed system in the strict sense is the universe as a whole, and we should apply quantum theory to that. And only then in the second step, by noticing that at large scales, a cosmic scales, gravity is the dominant interaction, we need a quantum theory of gravity to describe quantum cosmology. Now, um, I have prepared these five sections, so I will start from quantum mechanics because in a field such as quantum cosmology, many analogies and intuitions are drawn from standard quantum theory just by extrapolating. Uh, I will then say something about quantum gravity because we have to base the description on a theory of quantum gravity. And then um, the main part will be quantum cosmology, and in particular one issue that I had worked on myself in the past, how do classical properties, for example the classical, a classical metric, emerge from a fundamental quantum description. And I will also say something about the error of time. It was already mentioned, but was not discussed in, in, in much detail. Can we understand <coughs> the emergence of the error of time, the emergence of irreversibility from such a, a framework? Uh, I have not included here discussion, a detailed discussion of boundary conditions such as Hartle Hawking proposal and so on, just for reasons of time. But of course, I'm happy also to say something about that after my talk, if, if you wish to um, ask me. Um, now, the cent at the center of quantum theory of quantum mechanics is a superposition principle. If you open Dirac's classic textbook, I mean, this is how it starts. Uh, chapter 1, the superposition principle, this is the central principle. Um, and what does it mean? I have here split it up into a more kinematic and then the dynamical version. So pure kinematically it means the following, so let Psi 1 and Psi 2 be two physical states, then Alpha Psi 1 plus Beta Psi 2 is again a physical state with Alpha and Beta complex numbers. And if you have more than one degree of freedom, then this leads to the by now well-studied entanglement, or how Schrödinger called it, Verschränkung, between the systems. Now the tr classic example being the einstein potolsky rosen entanglement, but we now have many other um, examples. Um, this is consistent, of course, or must be consistent with the dynamics. The Schrödinger equation is linear, so, so the sum of two solutions is again a solution of two quantum, evolving quantum state. So from this you see that classical states, um, for example localized states, the localized wave packets um, in space, are form only a tiny subsystem, a tiny subset, so in the space of all possible states. So the, the generic quantum state is really a highly non-classical, entangled, uh, spread out state. Already in 1935, uh, uh, Erwin Schrödinger put it very clearly as follows. I would not call that one, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics, the one that enforces its entire departure from classical lines of thought. 
By the interaction, the two representatives of psi functions have become entangled. Another way of expressing the peculiar situation is the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of all its parts, even what? though they may be entirely separated. And of course, we under. Reverse. One usually say the opposite. Yeah. The best possible knowledge of the parts does not exhaust the knowledge of the whole. He says yeah. the opposite. Um, another way of expressing the peculiar is the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of all its parts, even though they may, yeah, it's true, but, but this, this is the quote, but, but, but we were, yeah, maybe he was... <laughs> this this is what he said. Yeah, this is what he said, yeah, this is what he said, but I think he can only mean the one that we mean that, I mean, the opposite, you, the opposite yes. Well, you yeah. only have density matrices for the parts, and yeah. he thought that there was yeah. Fine. But, but it was clear to him that the entanglement is the central thing and, and that if you have a local system that um, you, I mean, you, you, it's a, it, it, it has incomplete information about that. Yeah, I have to check the original, no, but the original is in English, so it's not due to my translation. But he says the, if we know a wave function of the full system, it does not imply the existence of wave functions for Yeah, yeah, parts. That in this sense it's correct, yeah. There are no wave functions for the parts, yeah. What he's saying. Yeah, there are no wave functions for the part, that is so. But you can, of course, have the density matrices and, and from them you get information, yeah. But in this sense it's correct, certainly. There, there are no wave functions of the part. Um, so, there are now many tests of the, of the superposition principle and I think this year in the summer was an announcement that uh, a Chinese satellite where you have superpositions entanglement between many hundreds of kilometers between Earth and the satellite. Um, a nice example is this one. So in Vienna they uh, managed to make in interference experiments with huge molecules, so not only small atoms, but these molecules that you find here in your blood, for example. So this is a biomolecule with this name and these fluorofullerenes. And um, here is the interference pattern. So you, you, you have one molecule, one single at one time that you bring through the multiple slit and you see the interference pattern. Um, now, decoherence, yeah, this is one example. Decoherence refers to the emergence of classical Properties. I mean, it, I do not give here a talk on decoherence, otherwise I would have included also the history. Um, so the von Neumann problem of having uh, how to understand the, the non-observation of macroscopic superpositions and the like. Um, I would just here give the definition so we understand this as the irreversible emergence of classical properties through the unavoidable interaction with the environment. So um, it means that a, a, a quantum system in generally is not isolated. Most systems are not isolated, but they are coupled and un they are unavoidably coupled with the degrees of freedom of their environment. So they become entangled. And uh, in order to understand what happens with the system, you must treat the full quantum system as a closed system, trace out the irre irrelevant degrees of freedom. And then what you observe in the local system is that under some general conditions, um, you will have this going out of information, which means that locally you do not see the interferences anymore, although they are there in the big system. Um, the coherence is already based on the irreversibility of the world because you need some particular initial conditions, if you're already in equilibrium, you would have decoherence and recoherence going um, the same way. So objects can then appear classically, although they are fundamentally described by quantum theory. I will give you an example anyway. So the first paper is the one by C in 1970, and then in the early years um, there have been not that many investigations. So, because the only the first experimental test by Serge Arroche here in, in Paris was only achieved in 1996. So before that, um, it was purely theoretical. By the way, as you put a list of things, maybe the paper of Klaus Hepp, um, it's on the algebraic side. It was. Uh, I, I could discuss this a bit more at, at length. There was this discussion between Klaus Hepp and John Bell, and um, where I mean Klaus Hepp made this formal limit, I mean, t to infinity, where all the interference went. And John Bell pointed out, t 
this is mathematically correct, but in physics we do not do that. At any finite time, he told Clausep, you still have these interferences there, because Clausep wanted to get rid of them exactly, yes. at the classical limit exactly. But for all practical purposes. Yeah, for all practical purposes. Yeah. 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 Okay, you're right, I mean, that, that one could have here some, some others. Um, yeah. So this is an, one example, it's not the first one, it's a later example also from the Vienna group. And um, what you see here is, again, they have these interferences of this, in this ca case, the, um, the fullerenes. And uh, now how do you introduce an environment? There are two options here. The first is you have this cavity and you increase the pressure in that cavity by bringing in gas molecules. And the other is just to heating up the system because this emits more photons. And this is also an environment that takes away the correlations. So in the first you, uh, example, you see here this increase in pressure. So you see here the normalized vis visibility of the interference pattern. I mean, the one that I had here before. So this is the visibility. You can define it quantitatively. And so the um, curve is a theoretical calculation, not a fit. And these dots are the measurements. Here you heat up the system. And um, yeah, you also find this decrease of the interference pattern. So it is in this sense, and just the time scale is perhaps milliseconds or something like that. It, it is this decrease that is then a manifestation of what we call decoherence. Sorry, but uh, in the second case, it has to be that the photons that are emitted for the two paths through the interferometer are somehow in orthogonal states. It's not um, completely clear to me what's... Um, I mean, for decoherence to lead to this suppression of interferences, different environmental states have to be approximately orthogonal. Right. right. And this is what usually is the case because you have here many photons. I mean, a single photon, maybe it's not yet enough, but you have here many photons like here also. And so if you have... Um, say these, o these overlap factors, which are not yet orthogonal, but you, if you have many of them, then approximately the states are ortho orthogonal. And it, I mean, this means that the environment can discriminate between the different system states. So when I'm in superposition of here and here, and then I, you introduce the interaction, maybe with scattering photons or scattering air molecules, then these environmental states can then roughly discriminate between me being here and being here, down to a certain distance. And for example, here in the room, it's the thermal deploy wavelengths of the gas molecules that is the fundamental limit to, to the localization. But for the, are you sure that it's not internal degrees of freedom of the molecule that are decohering the position? Degree um, well, I mean, in the experiment, you first have the, just the molecule, you make the interferences, you see the, you see the interference pattern, and then you slowly uh, here increase the pressure by bringing more molecules. I'm talking about the case And here you heat up, you heat it up, and then you have more photons. Well, that's what I'm questioning. Are you're you questioning sure this. <laughs> yeah, are you sure it's the photons and not the internal degrees of freedom of the molecule um, that matters? Um, I cannot see why the internal degrees of freedom Well, suppose are the, when the relevant. molecule goes through this slit, its internal yes. degrees of freedom are excited in one way, or affected in one way. Whereas if it goes through the other slit because there's a, a different sort of acceleration, they're affected in another way, such that when they come back together, the internal degrees of freedom are orthogonal to each other. So mm -hmm. even though the center of mass degree of freedom mm -hmm. would have interfered, uh, they don't because they're correlated to different internal states. Well, I have not calculated this case, but my suspicion would be that this effect is smaller than the effect with the photons because this is um, an irreversible effect, and these irreversible effects, the photons, they, these, they will go away. This is usually stronger, but I cannot base my claim now on a, on a calculation. Actually, I um, review what, what the experimentalists do. I mean, this is, a, I'm not sure whether this goes too far, but this is also this um, uh, situation with interference of charge, or say if you have an electron that you split up and you recombine it. So there were some claims that it's the Coulomb field by itself that is just there, which is also in a sense given by the system. 
Uh, but this is reversible. No? The, right. you, you can see while the, 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 the electron goes through the two slits, that in a sense there is no interference, but the Coulomb field then is reversible and, and it goes back again. So what people in experiments did was to check um, the limits when you really have from the acceleration of the charges, the, the emission of photons. There were experiments in the 90s in to begin about that. Where you, where you can check that and increase the separation of that. So then this is a really irreversible effect, which will then um, lead to the vanishing of the interference pattern, whereas the Coulomb field, then when you yeah. bring things together, uh, is again uh, the, the original system. So it's about the, an essential aspect is the irreversibility of the environment. But just to uh, mention a reference, the reason that I was tuned into the possibility I'm asking about is there was a paper a few years ago by Tom Banks, who's also a well-known quantum gravity theorist, on exactly this effect of a self-decoherence effect that large molecules could have mm -hmm. in principle. And he did some estimates. Mm -hmm. So it could be interesting to look at it. Yeah, Just also there. But at the usually self-decoherence um, effects, they are usually reversible effects because they are in, in, in the system. And if you bring this uh, you, back again, then um, mm -hmm. you... It's very different from a Coulomb field that's locked mm -hmm, to the charge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the molecule can deform and vibrate mm -hmm. in various ways. Okay, yeah, but then you have, uh, yeah, then not by emission of radiation, mm -hmm. but just by its own internal excitation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which it has because you've heated it up, so it's got enough energy to mm -hmm. move around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, the Alstom group have published. Um, Pardon? You mean this kind of... Um, internal decoherence, decoherence by internal degrees of freedom. Yeah, oh, but, but this is with the time dilation, you mean, this um, effect. Yeah, perhaps we can in the discussion session, because it's somewhat orthogonal yeah. to what follows. Um, it's a, but it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so what can be understood by decoherence? I would say that classical properties are not an attribute of an isolated system. They are defined, if you like, by the environment. Um, the important thing is that this was not so clear in the early years that the environment distinguishes a particular basis because you could say, well, I mean, I can anyway diagonalize the reduced density matrix at any time because I can diagonalize any density matrix. This is, of course, true, but um, if you have the environment, then the interaction with the environment gives you a distinguished basis with respect to which, given by the interaction Hamiltonian, with respect to which the uh, classical properties emerge. Uh, the decoherence time is tiny in macroscopic situations. I mean, you need a lot of experimental effort to resolve, say, those time scales. And uh, because of that, this leads to the appearance of events, particles, quantum jumps, things that can all be, as far as we know, described by the Schrodinger equation and thus emerge in a continuous way. People prefer then to talk about apparent collapse. By now, in contrast to these early years, the coherence is experimentally well established. It was especially mentioned in the uh, Laudatio for the Nobel Prizes for Arroche and Wineland in 2012. So Arroche in 1996 was, his group was the first with the cavity, the quantum, the, the Schrödinger cats in the, in, the, in the cavity and their decoherence. And Wineland, I think the same year or soon after, did it with ions. Um, what cannot be understood by decoherence? Um, certainly, it does. It's, it's, it's a process that is dealt with in standard quantum theory. So it uses just the standard formalism of quantum theory. So um, it cannot answer the question whether standard unitary quantum theory universe is universally valid or not. It assumes the universal validity. So uh, if the answer is yes, then the interpretation called Everett or many words interpretation holds, which is just the formalism without modification. Um, with decoherence, of course, as an important ingredient. If not, an alternative theory, so different fundamental equations must be seeked. For example, the GRW type collapse theories um, or the Boy Bohm theories, which are somehow in between. Um, of course, there are open, important questions such as why are there local observers? So decoherence only works because we have this hugely entangled quantum state and a, a subsystem, a small subsystem that probes this non-local state. Um, 
we do not know why there are local observers at all and why not everything is global. And the origin of irreversibility is put in here. I will say something about that at the end from the point of view of quantum cosmology. So in the following I will then study, I mean this was the talk that I should was asked to give, situation from a quantum gravitational field. <laughs> so I will not talk about further things in quantum mechanics and I will assume the universal universality of the superposition principle. So I will not discuss scenarios such as the one by Duyoshi or Penrose and others. Although you can ask me about that. Now I can also make connection to other talks. So um, important is the superposition principle. And uh, Feynman in the famous Chapel Hill conference of 1957 uh, made the following point that if you have a Stern Gerlach type of Gedanken experiment, so the silver atoms or the electron goes here and is split up, well, you have an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Spin up is deflected upwards, spin down deflected downwards, but if you spin right and it's in a superposition of upwards and downwards. So imagine this to be connected to a macroscopic system such as a ball of one centimeter diameter uh, such that if the deflection is upwards, so ball is moves upwards and deflection downwards, ball moves downwards. So if um, it's in a spin to the right, then you have a superposition of the ball. And so Feynman argues you have a superposition of a macroscopic system with a, which, for which you can measure the gravitational field by Cavendish balance. And you have to describe this by quantum gravity. So these are Feynman's words. If you believe in quantum mechanics up to any level, then you have to believe in gravitational quantization in order to describe this experiment. It may turn out, since we have never done an experiment at this level, that it's not possible. That there is something that matter with our quantum mechanics when we have too much action in the system or too much mass or something. But that is the only way I can see which would keep you from the necessity of quantizing the gravitational field. It's a way that I don't want to propose. <laughs> Okay, others like Penrose want to propose that, but he not. And we have at least in two talks by Steve and by Carlo, we, there was the reference to these new ideas about measuring this so-called gravitational or uh, uh, cat states, graph cat states. So one reference is the one um, I think that Carlo mentioned by Valletto and Valletto and Vedral, and also there's the Bose as all. You had this nice picture, and I don't want to repeat it because you explained it nicely in your talk, but the point is you have this superposition of the masses, uh, or you have these two masses that you put each in a superposition, that you only, that is only works, I mean, if the interaction is really by a quantum field, a gravitational field. I myself cannot judge about the feasibility of these experiments, but uh, I'm confident that this is possible in the not too far future. So this would be certainly... I don't understand your point. Yes? You're describing quantum cosmology or quantum gravity? Yes. Um, I, I, I describe quantum, quantum cosmology and I then argue that because quantum cosmology is at cosmic scales, I need to base it on a theory of quantum gravity. But uh, you say that the universe is an isolated system, mm -hmm. but you don't have an observer outside. The I don't have an observer outside, yes. So I didn't understand this link between the your first thing and the second one. I, I want this actually is the purpose of the talk to, to make this clear as the talk goes on <laughs> because because I want to discuss then the decoherence and this especially this relation to the first part but I have not yet arrived at this okay. <laughs> sorry so okay so what are the approaches to quantum gravity we already heard about and uh, approaches John Wheeler once wrote no question about quantum gravity is more difficult than the question or is the question <laughs> <laughs> or what is the correct approach I should say here so certainly the oldest and maybe still most conservative one is applying quantization rules to, Einstein, to a successful theory of gravity Einstein's theory of general relativity <laughs> Um, you can do it with covariant using covariant methods, originally just the perturbation theory, but now it's mainly pass integrals, <coughs> say dynamical triangulation or spin foams. Uh, or you need to use the canonical approaches, um, the original variables just using the metric, or later developments such as using the connection or loops. String theory, of course, 
approaches the problem from a totally different angle, starting with a quantum theory of all interactions from the very beginning and then trying to isolate quantum aspects of gravity in certain limits. In a sense, gravity there is emergent in string theory, uh, whereas in the earlier approaches, of course, it's directly given. And there are other approaches, um, fundamental discrete approaches that either have been devised by their own or they've grown out of string theory or loop quantum gravity. And here are some names of these. Um, before I go to one particular approach, which will be geometrodynamics, I would like to emphasize one point that was already emphasized by Gabriele Veneziano about the experimental evidence that we have for quantum gravity so far, uh, which is from the early universe. And so if you do this, if you believe in the inflationary scenario of, of the early universe and uh, the calculation of the power spectrum from inflation, so you start with a quantum vacuum state, that both uh, gravitons and matter fields are in their ground state, then you find that gravitons are created out of the vacuum during the inflationary phase. And you can make the calculation that quantized gravitational mode functions in the situ space have this relation. So the expectation value of this two-point function is basically the Planck time times the Hubble parameter squared. And this gives you the power spectrum. Well, people usually define the power spectrum by this quantity, but I think it's not so important now with the factors. Basically, it's Planck time times Hubble parameter squared. <coughs> This is the famous thing. So if you could observe this, then, I mean, it would not work as Gabriele emphasized with a classical gravitational field because everything would just be smooth. It, you, know, you need a quantum, a quantum gravity and uh, it's really proportional to Planck, Planck time squared. Now there was some excitement about the possible discovery three years ago, the BICEP2 experiment at the South Pole which has claimed to have seen this, I mean, indirectly in the, in the B modes of the CMB. Um, okay, most likely this signal comes from a dust foreground, but there are continuing efforts to see whether <coughs> one can measure effects of these created gravitons. But even without that, I mean, we have certainly measured the, the density fluctuation. So if you um, have the scalar modes, and I think that was also Gabriel, perhaps, who, may, who has emphasized that point. Um, because for this to work, to really have to combine the fluctuations of the inflaton together with the fluctuations of the metric into one gauge invariant combination. You cannot just set one classical knot. So also in this, for, for this to work, we need um, the quantized nature of the metric. Otherwise, you do not get this result. This is the result also Tp times h squared. You have this uh, parameter from slow roll inflation, which of course depends on the dynamics. Um, but this is certainly, I would say, also from the, from the quantum metric. This is from observation and there's this famous R parameter, which gives you the ratio between the tensor and the scalar um, power spectrum, which is given by that. So, if if this if, if it were a, if one were able to measure this, then you would also have the tensor fluctuations, which would be directly the gravitons. So yeah, this is the famous photo uh, or the famous diagram. Um, so with with the power spectrum um, that was calculated. So I want to emphasize the following: that within the inflationary scenario, the observed CMB fluctuations can only be understood from a quantized metric plus a scalar field modes. Yeah, so in this sense, I would say it's an indirect test of at least linearized quantum gravity, because when you calculate that, what you write there, you have this Wuhan of Sasaki variables and you expand it into the, um, say, the plane waves with A and A dagger, no? with creation and inhalation or So you do standard quantum calculations for a metric perturbation. And this is why I call it quantum gravity an observed effect of quantum gravity. Uh, what is the scalar field modes there? Um, I have not written down the details. Um, um, so in cosmic perturbation theory, you have a scale, uh, for inflation, it's the scalar field, and you have um, a flat, usually a flat uh, Friedman universe. Yeah? And then you, you, you expand about 
background of Friedman universe and the background homogeneous scalar field. There are fluctuations of the phi and you have fluctuations of the metric. And you, for cosmic perturbations here, you have to put them together in a gauge invariant way. Let's call it V, Muhanosa. And this is the one, the quantum variable I'm talking about. Um, yeah. So let's go then to quantum <laughs> um, gravity and uh, one of the oldest approaches is the direct quantization of general relativity in the metric variables, um, which goes back, um, well, already Dirac, in a, in a, in a way, had, uh, had this, but it was certainly then um, investigated and developed by Wheeler and De Witt in the 1960s. And we also already had heard about the wheeler de Witt equation. So what's the result of this canonical quantization is you have the constraints, and classically you have the Hamiltonian and so-called momentum constraints and you implement them in the quantum theory by in a more or less heuristic way transforming the Hamiltonian into an operator applying it on, wave, on a wave functional and set it to zero. Um, you can arrive at these equations in a way similar to what Schrödinger did in 1926. What he did, I mean he knew from De the Broglie there must be a wave equation or should be a wave equation so he reformulated mechanics in Hamilton-Jacobi form and he guessed a wave equation that gives back the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and what we call the WKB limit. And if you do the same for relativity, you rewrite it in Hamilton-Jacobi form, which was done by Peres in 1962, and you guess a wave equation that gives back this, then you find the wheeler de equation. So unless you assume that something breaks down, some the superposition principle or the standard framework, you arrive at those equations. Um, H psi equals zero, so um, this is the, the structure. Here is for just for the vacuum. Um, point is that psi depends only on the three geometry, not the four dimensional geometry. So H, A, B is a three metric. So this is the kinetic term, the potential term. This is a three dimensional Ricci scalar, cosmological constant, the determinant of the three metric, the gravitational constant. This is called the bit metric. It depends on the three metric and serves as, as a metric on the space of all metrics, a super metric if you like. Uh, you also have these so-called momentum constraints. Their interpretation is that Psi uh, remains invariant under an infinitesimal coordinate transformation on the three metric. Okay, so you see there is no time here, no external time t here, and uh, this is not so surprising in retrospect, so John Wheeler has explained it here at the blackboard. So um, if you have this analogy with mechanics, uh, mechanics you have a trajectory going from A to B, but if you quantize, of course the trajectory is gone. Um, in mechanics you have, or in quantum mechanics you have of course the absolute time t still there. In relativity the trajectory is, so to speak, a whole of space-time. Yeah, as a succession of three geometries, and there's no absolute time in addition. So if you apply the same quantization here, the space-time is gone in the same way as a trajectory is gone in quantum mechanics. And so only space remains and time is not there at the fundamental level. Um, so this is a straightforward con uh, uh, consequence of quantization of but, but this is relativity. The Hamiltonian constraint. This is, this is the Hamiltonian constraint. constraint. And, yeah, so yeah, so this is not the exact... Uh, is the Exact quantization means uh, it comes from the Hamiltonian constraint because uh, yeah. So how do you confer say infer that this is the this is after quantization you are getting it because yes this is this after quantization so this is quantum geometrodynamics after quantization yeah I meaning classical theory of course you have space time um, also you have the trajectories of course you have many situations where you can have narrow wave packets. Yeah, like in atomic physics, the Rydberg atoms, you can have nice wave packets, but not for the ground state. And also here, of course, you have situations where you have wave packets and others where you have non-classical features. So in a sense, it's both conservative and not conservative, conservative from the point of view of standard quantum theory, um, but applied to a more complicated situation. Um, yeah, so here again, this is sometimes called the problem of time, although it's not clear whether it's really is a problem. <laughs> so the external time t has vanished from the formalism and it's understandable why. 
This also holds for loop quantum gravity. I think Carlo will uh, agree with that because it's also canonical quantum gravity. And yeah, okay, this one should discuss for further, but also probably for string theory. <laughs> um, the wheel to wheel equation, if you look at more carefully here, um, this thing is not a, a, a Laplace, but it's more a, like a Dunham bear operator because this has signature minus plus 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 plus. So it looks more like a, a, a a wave equation in the sense of an oscillating string. Uh, so you could, you could associate a so-called intrinsic time with it, which comes from the sweet geometry itself and is dis distinguished by the sign. And the sign basically comes from the, from the conformal factor, the square root of h. Um, I perhaps discuss, do not discuss this in much detail. The Hilbert space structure and quantum mechanics is connected with the probability interpretation in particular with its conservation in time, which is unitarity, but if you do not have an external time, the question arises um, whether you need the probability interpretation at all, or you need a Hilbert space at all. Yeah, so I think David once wrote something like that probability is only an emergent notion in the semi-classical limit. But the metric is not positive definite. G that, uh, the, the three metric is positive definite, but, the, this but not the De Witt yes, metric. So, so how yeah. do you interpret the probability here from density things? Um, I, I have not yet uh, discussed, I, I, this is a general uh, statement yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, then you arrive, this has been discussed at length in literature about using the Klein-Gordon inner product or the Schrödinger in, inner product. Here my point is more general, the point is just that because there is no external time t, the question arises, I do not answer it here, but the question arises whether a Hilbert space is needed or not. Did you say that DeWitt called, said probability was emergent? Um, I would have to check um, the exact wording, but in, his, in the Jerusalem proceedings of Marcel Grossman, where he gave a talk in 1999 or something like that, I can't remember. There, 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 there is a remark that I'll also quote somewhere. I can give you the exact quote. <laughs> right. Yeah, so problem of time, it seems now we have a problem, um, especially in quantum cosmology where everything is, is quantum. The only thing that really has to be, of course, checked and where a potential problem could arise is the recovery of quantum fields in curved space time. So whatever the fundamental theory is and whatever its interpretation problems are, you should have a bridge to the standard physics, which is here uh, the quantum field theory in external time, and I don't go into that, this is also an extra uh, formalism, but one can show that an expansion of the wheeler -Witt equation with respect to the Blanc mass, so, uh, which basically an expansion with respect to g times h bar, Blanc mass squared, um, leads to the function of Schrödinger equation for the non-gravitational field in a space-time that is a solution of Einstein's equation. So this is a formalism that is familiar from molecular physics, where it is called von Oppenheimer approximation, where you have um, the heavy nuclei and the light electrons, and where you can um, make use of the fact that the nuclei are much heavier than the electrons. So in the first approximation, they are more or less uh, at rest, and you can solve then the, the Schrödinger equation for the electrons in this configuration. Then the next orders give the corrections for the motion of the, of the nuclei. And what is there, the mass of the nuclei becomes here the Blanc mass. And this has been discussed already many years ago and it was a, a topic in the 1980s. And there have been given derivations, different derivations, but more or less with the same result, starting from Lapchinsky and Rubakov giving this that time is emergent and comes from, from, the to, from the, as I will show you, from the total wave function. Um, just to remark, uh, what, what we did then uh, rather early with, with T.P. Singh from Bombay was to, to go beyond that limit and to calculate correction terms to the Hamiltonian. So you have the Schrödinger equation for the non-gravitational field coming from this wheeler de -Witt equation, and if you go on with the 1 over Planck mass squared, then of course you get corrections 1 over Planck mass squared, um, which, yeah, so with Andrei Barwinski in 98, we have given a covariant picture of this in terms of Feynman diagrams, um, and more recently we have calculated these contributions to the 
CMB anisotropy spectrum. So you can do a calculation without ambiguities because in cosmic perturbation theory you have no problems with infinities and the like because the various modes are independent. You can calculate a correction to this result here. Yeah, so you get this result uh, plus a correction. Okay, the negative thing is that it's too small <laughs> to be seen by any current experiment. What is the expansion parameter? What is the ratio? And the ratio is, yeah, yeah, it is of course dimensionless. So, um, so you in, in, in the examples you always find, of course, dimensionless ratios. And here what you find is it's calculated within inflationary. See, so the Hubble parameter of inflation over m Planck squared, I mean, if I said c and so equal to 1. So this, and then one can one get results. You have a, um, a violation of scale invariance, for example, and you have numerical coefficients, but uh, you cannot beat this here. So this would only be observable if inflation were closer to the Planck scale, which it isn't. So, I mean, the Planck collaboration gives here the limit that h is smaller than 10 to the minus 5 mp. So this is here, yeah. <laughs> and this cannot be seen um, with the Planck satellite. But I would say, the, well, maybe we also did not expect it that it would be big, but at least you can show that you can get definite numbers out of this framework. And that if you had a magnifying glass, or that you could see how the power spectrum would change. Uh, yeah. Okay, but quantum cosmology means, of course, applying quantum theory to the universe as a whole. And uh, it was very popular from the <coughs> early days on, of course, to use simple models such as uh, Flipman Lemaitre models distinguished from the gravitational side just by the scale factor together with some homogeneous field and to quantize them. This is so-called the mini superspace. I mean, I think Miesner coined this mini superspace because the full configuration space of the field geometry was baptized by John Wheeler as superspace before the advent of supersymmetry, I should say. Now this one has to emphasize this for the advent of supersymmetry and then um, Miesner for the simple model called this mini superspace. We are familiar with that, but maybe to outsiders the word looks a little bit strange. Uh, and so this is the classical metric, the S squared, so minus this just the lapse function, which gives you the time reparameterization invariance plus A squared. And here I have used just the closed three-dimensional universe. So A is the dynamical variable, and you see classically you have A of t. And if you add a scalar field, a homogeneous scalar field, phi of t, then in the quantum theory, the t is, a, is gone. And the only thing is that a and phi is left. So we have a two-dimensional configuration space on which the wave function lives. And uh, whereas the full wheeler dvd equation has many mathematical problems that I have not um, started to discuss here, at that level, the mathematics is, is clear because you have a two-dimensional partial differential equation. So you see here, this is the kinetic term, and you see here that it's really um, has a one plus and one minus, and the, the wrong sign, so to speak, comes with the scale factor. In general, it comes with the scale, but here we only have the scale. So this is the derivative with respect to the scalar field, then uh, here you have a cosmological constant term and some them here. Okay, units has, have been chosen conveniently, the factor ordering has also been chosen in a certain way. Now this is the equation on which you can base your discussion. And what are the new issues? So one issue, I mean, before we come to this decoherence, is uh, there's a new concept of determinism, if you like, if you take this equation seriously. Let us compare the classical theory with the quantum theory. So classically, say, for, for a two-dimensional model, here we have a recollapsing universe model. Okay, it doesn't reflect the actual observations, but it's a model. So we have here, um, say from the Big Bang, the expansion, the maximum, and the recollapse. And if you calculate this, for example, on the computer, you can give initial conditions here, and then you see the evolution. In this sense, the recollapsing part is the deterministic success of the expansion, expanding part. Of course, you could start from here. This is not. There's no absolute direction on it, but there's a trajectory 
But how do you deal with this in the quantum cosmology situation? For example, if you want to cal uh, calculate a wave packet that is concentrated around this, there is no time t. You cannot put the wave packet here and somehow propagate it to here. What you do, you must solve the equation. And this is a hyperbolic equation. So uh, with respect to A. Yeah? And so what you would attempt to do is to have a wave packet here and here and then to solve the equation from smaller a to, to larger a. This is how you would deal with such an equation. And uh, the point is you must put also this packet here, this part, as your initial condition, because if you did not, of course you, you can just omit it, then you get just a smeared out wave function without classical resemblance. But to get here a wave packet, you must put this here and here. Yeah, you must add a equals constant and give it here. So in this sense, one can say that the recollapsing wave packet must be present initially, initially with respect to the intrinsic time and to the equation. So there is quantum cosmology, no intrinsic difference between Big Bang and Big Crunch. It's both the same region of small a, because we little bit only this discriminates between small and large a, but not between ends of a classical trajectory. And this is an example, actually, okay, quite old, that I calculated. Um, you can discuss this model that you can find by coupling a conformally coupled, coupled scalar field to Friedman and making rate definitions and choosing units so that it has this nice form of an indefinite harmonic oscillator. Yeah, so d squared, or the a squared minus d squared over the chi squared minus a squared plus chi is zero. So classically, then the solutions are Lisa Shu ellipses or half of Lisa Shu ellipses. And to have wave packets, you must really choose here at the beginning two wave packets and then you can see that you get here a superposition of two classical solutions. But if you, for example, only had here an initial condition, then you would have give something smeared out. Now what I want to show with this is that you can then do address standard quantum mechanical questions like people do in quantum optics with feedback atoms, but there are differences in the form of the equations and also in, in the conceptual consequences, for example, concerning time. Here, no? and this, this is, I think, in my opinion at least, it's important. Um, a brief reference to singularity avoidance, David, in his pioneering paper of 1967, um, there are many materials already present that <laughs> was later discussed. He suggested the vanishing of the wave function at the point of the classical singularity, independent of the unknown, maybe, mathematics of that. Well, it's uh, for the curvature singularities. Yes, yeah. Well, he discussed the curvature, curvature singularities. Not, uh, how can you explain the singularities? No. Uh, well, not, um, you mean not the, the general singularities. Well, in his paper, he discussed the Big well, Bang singularity. You know, but I think you can extend it to, to other singularities. We did it also for these big rip and big break singularities of dark energy. Uh, so. Um, or that you have a spreading of wave packets when you approach an, the region of the classical si singularity. So we and also others have discussed some models where we have investigated to which extent the Witt's condition can be implemented in models of quantum cosmology and you can Im actually implement them in, in, in a variety of ways so that where classically, I mean you have the singularity, say the Big Bang and where the trajectory would run into the wave function, one can consistently impose that psi be zero there. And, and so when you approach that, I mean, there's no unitarity or something with respect to the scale factor. So when you approach this thing, I mean, the wave function just decreases exponentially before reaching it. Are you going to talk about any relation between that and the no boundary? Uh, I, I would be happy to discuss also more about the no boundary condition. Um, if then time allows, maybe after having now discussed the decoherence. But could you just say in a word, do you th is the boundary condition you just mentioned related to or equal to? Or I would it say it's a, totally um, um, the boundary condition, um, perhaps the psi to zero. Um, I think it's a generating conflict with it. I'm, I should make a critical remark now if you ask and if the audiences allow, then I can make a critical remark about this no boundary condition here. Because um, if you, for example, have this model, for this model you can calculate the path integrals exactly because there are two oscillators. Okay, you have to integrate over the lapse function and the like. This has been done long ago. 
And uh, what you find is that the solutions from the no-boundary proposal, the exact solutions, um, cannot be used to construct wave packets because either one is the Bessel function I0 and the other is the Bessel function K0. So either they um, exponentially increase into the classically forbidden region or they diverge along the light cone of mini, mini superspace. So these are so you get solutions that are totally different from what you would say here used to have a wave tube and something like that. So we discussed this long ago, also this year there was a workshop in Santa Fe with Wheeler and De Witt. And De Witt was very much concerned about the no boundary proposal because of, um, well, this was not yet calculated, but in Hawking's example there was this exponential increase of um, e to the plus one half squared. And he was very much concerned about whether this is of use and I remember Jonathan Halliwell was there and he said, yeah, this is true, but this is a new interpretation. All these exponentially increasing branches we interpret as Euclidean branches that have to be omitted because they refer to, to other words. Uh, David was not convinced by that uh, argument. But I mean, you, you can say what... Um, um, I mean, the, I think the formalism is clear. I mean, to calculate the no boundary equation for this, I think, is also clear. And so the discrepancy is about the interpretation, whether you are bothered by the fact that there you get non-classical features necessarily of the wave function, and you cannot have something that corresponds everywhere to the classical uh, uh, state, or whether, I mean, whether you are bothered by that or not bothered. But still, the semi-classical state does not correspond. I mean, the full, the exact, the exact. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, I'm not. I mean, the semi-classical you often have no, just e to the, the ISs. That, 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 the exact the state. The mm -hmm. wave packet that corresponds to a classical mm -hmm. trajectory does not go well with the initial yeah. with the no boundary condition. Um, so yes, the yes, yes. Well, I mean, you can have many exact. This is an exact solution here. You can have an exact solution from the no boundary condition, which is then. If I remember correctly, um, you have this basically this Bessel functions I naught of something like this, I think, and this here. I think if you add a positive cosmological constant, things are much better behaved. This could be, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not a proof, a general proof of the full theory, but somehow for such an oscillator, if it does not work here. Yeah, yeah, right. You, then the other op option would be to look for situations where, where this correspondence holds. There's no general rule. But also this uh, other older um, semi-classical results by Hawking of 84 and so on, which lead, give you here this exponentially increasing pieces. Somehow it seemed that they were not so, so easily avoidable. In the, yeah. So if you have in the classically forbidden region increasing pieces, so it depends, you should form your own opinion of whether we have a new interpretation or not. Um, yeah. So this for the no boundary condition. So finally, the decoherence. Um, so in quantum cosmology, arbitrary superpositions of the field and matter states can occur. So how can we understand the image of an approximate classical universe? So this brings me back to, to <laughs> the first part. Um, there, of course, we have standard quantum mechanics and there's no ambiguity of the formalism and of the calculations and the interpretation. Of course, here you use the analogy and hope that they work to some extent. And uh, first, of course, for this we have to introduce inhomogeneities because for a two-dimensional model there is no issue. Uh, there's no decoherence because we need many degrees of freedom like in decoherence, the environmental degrees of freedom. And these are the inhomogeneities. So environment is just a metaphor. So um, what you have, you have a relevant and irrelevant degrees of freedom. Everything is in the universe, but the coherence is in configuration space. And so you have to have a big configuration space with a part that you consider relevant and a part that you consider irrelevant. And this, you will see what the irrelevant part is. So we describe small inhomogeneities by multipoles around the mini superspace variables. So this is what Halliwell and Hawking in 1985 did. So the wheel of the wheel equation now has this mini superspace part and uh, has this part from the multipole expansion. 
And because we have cosmic perturbation theory, they are small, they, they do not interact among themselves, they interact only with the background. This is indicated here. And then, um, this you can also do in this one open timer scheme. So, if psi naught, well, if you have this ansatz, psi is psi naught, the product of all psi n, and if this psi naught is of this form, is a slowly varying prefactor, then one can derive from this uh, approximately a Schrödinger equation for um, the psi n, where the i comes from here. So, S naught is a solution of the Hamilton Jacobi equation for the background. So it, it, it gives you the classical background, and uh, d over t is the directional derivative. Uh, yeah, if this is not clear, so you have here, I mean, s naught equal constant hypersurface. So, so this gives you then, um, if you like, the geometric optic limits, and then you can associate formal trajectories with it, with that. That you can parameterize by NAPLA as not NAPLA. NAPLA is here um, A and phi. So this you can call d over dt. I'm a bit short in that, but this is basically what it is. Um, yeah, and so you get an approximate time which one can call WKB time, is the time that controls the dynamics in this approximation. Now the coherence, of course, you might say, well, what is system? Yeah, sorry, I can. Sorry, the back sorry, sorry. <laughs> the back reaction of the inhomogeneities uh, on uh, mm -hmm. the zero mode. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can it be worked out completely, or has never um, been? They, they will occur then in the next orders of the for yes. some of the Planck mass to the minus two you expansion. Can get also. Okay, just yeah. So so the first correction is that you have this one over our Planck mass squared correction to the Hamiltonian and also you can get a back reaction which in principle gives them infinities you know, because ex you can have these expectation values um, of, of the HNs which you can regularize and so on. And in a sense you find the, the old semi-classical Einstein equation as this an approximate is, thing. But this is a question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Corrections but it, to the semi-classical, it's not clear whether they can be worked out completely. Um, for, the co for the exact case, I have no idea whether they can work out, but in such examples you can, because in cosmology you have, you can think, well, it, you have infinitely many modes, but you can think <laughs> about natural cutoffs, for example, at the horizon of the quasi decitor space. Yeah. But this is not, uh, I mean, we have not gone to that order here. So, so here, innocently, you do as if um, here the, there's no back reaction. And in fact, then if you, if you calculate the power spectrum from this, I mean, you using these Mukano Sasaki variables and having the expectation value um, of, of, of uh, if the variables V, V, and V dagger with respect to the state, then you find exactly this spectrum earlier. You know? So at that level you find this and, okay, the question is then about the back reaction. So we have calculated one correction this, and higher order terms need to be regularized and, yeah. This is not the back reaction of all matter on all gravity, it's only the back reaction on the slowly... On yes, the on the slowly matter. evolving degrees of freedom, so yes. gravitational matter interaction is still in the HN. Most of it. Um, yeah, or if you have, so to speak, if you had nonlinear interactions here, which you have neglected. This is the nice thing in, in this cosmic perturbation theory that um, if you stop at just this order and having no interaction, that these calculations work. The problems arise mainly if you also have these interactions between them. Yeah. And I don't claim that, that this is solved. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, sorry if I'm, if I'm too fast. Also, yeah, but as long as the chairman does not <laughs> interfere. So, um, of course, you need to know what is a system and what is an environment. And I already emphasized that this is a configuration space, so you have to divide the configuration space into a relevant and irrelevant part. And the idea, um, okay, this scene is now already very old stuff, is that um, the system consists of global degrees of freedom and that the environment are then these dense, small density fluctuations and the gravitational waves. So there are certainly many primordial gravitational waves around which we have not under control but which interact with the 
with the scale factor and the inflaton field. And so you can do calculations based on that, which I do not present here. It would perhaps be too boring to go to the details. This is only one example that I calculated a little bit later with my Russian colleagues, Babinski and Kamenchik, because in this old paper, I, because again, there I have to sum over infinitely many modes, which gives a divergence also for the decoherence factor. And I just made naively a cutoff at a Planck scale. I did not know better. But um, with the help of my colleagues, um, we have uh, implemented a more sophisticated regularization scheme, um, which I could explain, but which is perhaps not so important here, such that the sum over the infinitely many modes comes out as finite. And we have this finite, so this is a finite, uh, uh, the finite result for the density matrix of the scale factor. Uh, it comes from, I mean, the full quantum state after integrating out all these xn and after assuming, as one usually does, that they are in this bunch Davies initial state, I should say. So all of this is then in the calculations, but the calculations are not here. Uh, so only the result. And you see here, there is this um, non diagonal term h minus a prime squared. And you have here the A, and this is the Hubble parameter of inflation, and this is a numerical constant, a positive one. That um, for bigger A, I mean, these interferences are really suppressed. So the coherence, so the Gaussian is narrower for, for bigger A. So the, more, the bigger the, the universe is, the more classical it, it behaves, even if you start with arbitrary superpositions yes. from the very beginning. What do you mean exactly here by classical property? There are two, two interpretations I have in mind. One is uh, that uh, uh, the diagonal part of the density matrix are small. Um, um, that, um, what I mean is that the non-diagonal parts um, okay. asymptotically okay. vanish. So the diagonals and the density matrix, the diagonals give the probabilities yeah, so the and the off-diagonals give the interferences. So you don't mean at all that uh, the, the wave function itself is a, is a semi-classical wave packet on a given classical solution? Mm -hmm. Not at all. It's, it's a no, no. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, so, yeah. I mean, what, what I assume is that they are in this bomb Oppenheimer limit. It's in this space, but it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. decoious. Yeah, so you have um, wave functions like that, for example, if e to the i s naught of a phi times the product of n psi n a phi x n plus say to basically was it's a real equation this here and times this something like that for example you have you know and I use this limit here of the because otherwise I, I, there is no issue in my, if of the time yeah, so so then you can you can this and I think I have in the next trans piece the analogy of this with the situation in molecular physics again. Uh, yeah. This environment is unquantized. In no, everything is quantized. Everything is quantized. So the environment is this, 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 this wave function. This is the full psi with everything, with a phi and x. And the input was that I can ha somehow identify in the argument what is the background and so-called back, what is a and phi and what are the fluctuations. This is the, otherwise if you have an arbitrary inhomogeneous universe. But the gravitational waves and these are very classical things. So how uh, do you, what do you mean by quantized gravitational waves or things like that? Um, I'm not sure whether I understand. <laughs> so, I mean, here, the, here this is the example that I, this calculated the coherence by the gravitons. So the gravitons they are in, 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 in a quantum state. Yeah, it's a Gaussian state. You can write it down a Gaussian state. So if f is the variable for the gravitons or so fn, then you have a Gaussian state where the okay. um, omega in the Gaussian state depends on a and phi. And the bunch Davis type of, of vacuum is used. You can also use um, non vacuum initial states, but this is not usually done and also it has problems in cosmic perturbation theory, yeah. So, so this is then, okay, so you see here, uh, off-diagonal terms are suppressed, and of course it's a, you, have, you can insert your numbers <coughs> to check that, I mean, when this was sufficiently classical, and it turns out that it's consistent with having universe classical properties at, okay, I should here, of course, quotes, because this is already classical language, 
at the beginning of inflation. Yeah, so this is the example from quantum mechanics. I mean here you see the Villot-Witt equation is real and this is why this is a perfectly well-defined solution but time you only get from, from this branch or from this branch. So it only works if you have decoherence between the two and if there's no overlap because otherwise you don't get a Schrödinger equation. And in molecular physics we have a similar situation. There we have a Hamiltonian that is parity invariant but we find many molecules that distinguish a certain orientation, so-called chiral molecules, sugars for example. And um, so here is an exa a simple example, maybe ammonia. So there you have this standard double well potential. So the ground state is smeared out and the first excited state is also smeared out. But the local, localized state you find from a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state by having, say, left or right. And so um, the question whether you have here superpositions of these and really a parity invariant state or whether you are in the left or on the right is a quantitative question. And people have calculated such situations by, for example, having scattering by light or air. And then you find quantitatively that small molecules still are in the superposition. This is why we have ammonia mesas. So, so the, um, the nitrogen oscillates here. But if this becomes bigger and bigger, the coherence is more effective. Uh, and then you have a, a vanishing overlap between this and this, and you somehow have, think you have only one of them. So you have for, for sugar, then the left-handed or the right-handed, but you don't have this superposition. So what was originally a paradox to the fathers of quantum theory, like the Hund's paradox, was Hund in 1927 has posed this question, is in a sense can be understood within standard quantum mechanics just by doing calculations for realistic systems. And in quantum cosmology you have this with the i to the e to the i s null, e to the i components. For example, if you make a calculation such as this one, but with weak gravitational waves, uh, okay, then for our universe, for our big universe, you find small overlap factors. Um, that, so that you, with this accuracy, you can say that you can have either this or this, or this you have no interferences with the other. By the way, in computing the overlap, does one need something like the scalar part? Yeah, yeah, good question, <laughs> but I can answer. <laughs> so um, I, I had this voice about a full Hilbert space, but the point is that all what you need is here the overlap of these psi n's. And at that level, here of the one omega, you have the Schrodinger equation. So we only, or I, we only use the standard Schrodinger Hilbert space for these modes xn. Yeah, so they are normalizable, so these are the modes that are in their bunch davis vacuum. And uh, so there's no ambiguity with that. So the open problems are here with the, with the, with the scale factor and so on. So fortunately, this, this works. Otherwise, that would, we would not know how to calibrate the power spectrum um, of inflation and, and the quantum correction. Yeah. So um, once one understands the classicality of the background, one can also ask the question about the quantum nature of the fluctuations themselves, because they, according to the standard scenario, they serve as the seeds for structure formation in the standard way by having then leading to the um, stochastic properties of the microwave background and of course this only works if they themselves are classical to some degree. So that this we have uh, investigated uh, with David Polarski and Alexei Staubinsky some time ago, Loma was a student of us um, and I do not present the calculations here but uh, one can do this and what we found is that during the inflationary phase there is a quantum to classical transition for the ubiquitous fluctuates of the inflator and the metric. We also give the limitations, there's a remaining coherence and so on. So, but you can understand it by this method or by this process of, of decoherence. And also it's, it, um, you may say this is perhaps very academic, but it's not so because there are also observable results that depend on what is the pointer basis of the coherence. Yeah, and there was a dispute in the 90s whether it's particle number, for example, or whether it's, it's the field amplitude. 
but you get different results. So if it were the field amplitude, it would mean that you would have maximal entropy for the modes, and then you would not find, you have no coherences left giving this acoustic oscillation. So it only works for the, for the if, if the pointer basis is the field amplitude, which actually we found here also. In the previous transparency, you were tracing over yes, the Yes, yes. So this shows so that... Now we are saying the transitions, I mean, the yes, yes. become classical. So yes. is there in the formalism... Uh, this is, this is, of course, an important thing. It means that um, what is, ir is irrelevant in one situation can become relevant in another situation. And so this is only uh, in, in this previous transparency, so there are sum over all this. No? So even the wavelengths that never enter this um, CMB calculation. So there are always enough of them irrelevant. But here we focus on, 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 a, on a wavelength regime, which is relevant in the sense of the CMB observations. Yeah, so they also interact then with, for example, one can have interaction of the these relevant wavelengths, which um, are bigger than h to the minus 1 in cosmic perturbations here, with the smaller wavelengths or with other fields that have to be added by hand, and then you get this. Yeah. So it... Uh, um, but, but for instance, conceptually, does it mean that at this stage, we need to think that we will observe, I mean, people like us, <laughs> and we define the set of states and operators that are relevant, irrelevant, coarse grain or not, and this determines the quantum to classical, and some other choice of algebra of operators could give a different uh, transition? Mm, um, it's not really us, it's a, a, a consequence of the full Hamiltonian, the various degrees of freedom and the interaction between them. Yeah, so in a sense... need to say which class of things we are interested in. Yeah, okay, this of course we do, because we do cosmology, but I mean the interaction takes place even without us. Of course, it's, we, we, we put in these assumptions also that we have a background and fluctuations, which is also put in. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, and um, I understand your question, I could explain this also in more quantitative detail, but just saying that um, say if we had started from, from there and identified the relevant degrees of freedom, those that finally become this uh, hot and cold spots in the, in the CMB, oops, here, here, only then, and then I would say, okay, I leave them out in the calculation that I had done first, which are only about, say, the very small wavelengths that are never relevant in, in any case, and they, they suffice, actually they give the main contribution <laughs> to these first results. So I could even, I mean, we have formally summed over infinite sum and recurrelized this, but one could have said that, okay, we have the relevant part is A and phi, and those fluctuations that can be seen in the CMB, and the irrelevant part are all the others. So this would perhaps be conceptually clearer than what I did. Here, yeah, thank you for your question. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is okay, a famous uh, photo from the Hubble Space Telescope, just to emphasize that, okay, once we have the quantum to classical transition for the prime order fluctuations, we can take all the standard formalism for having the stochastic nature of them and having this, the usual cosmic evolution then to the, to the large scale structure. So according to the inflation scenario, then and the coherence, so all of this can be traced back to quantum fluctuations. So the last few, maybe three or so transparent, oh yeah, time has, has gone, but there were already discussion sessions, so uh, <laughs> about the error of time, so this is maybe for the last five minutes, plus discussion of course. So, Pen, so Penrose some time ago addressed the question how special is the universe in terms of entropic arguments and he concluded the entropy of the observed part of the universe I don't talk about multiverses here, just double, double scale is maximal if all its mass is in one black hole and the probability of our universe would then be as follows I have updated it some years ago using the accelerated expansion of the universe so I have taken the Schwarzschild-Sitter solution and just the Schwarzschild solution and so on. But 
this is maybe only uh, it's only changing the number. So what he did was having e to the s, where s is the total entropy of the universe, over e to the s max, where s max is the maximally possible, where you have one black hole here in the De Sitter universe. This is the number here. So, okay, so what is this number? This is, comes from astronomers who have estimated the total S, I mean the non-gravitational part, is from the CMB. This is around 10 to the 89, but then you have all these supermassive black holes in galaxies. So our supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxies has 10 to the 90 KB, which is already bigger than all the non-gravitational entropy in all of the universe. And if you add up all, if you estimate how many supermassive black holes there are, then you find this. And by the maximal possible entropy is this, when you see this is big, but uh, compared to that it's negligible. So you have this very small number. And Penrose concludes from this, yeah, the universe is so special, it must, this must have a really a, 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 a reason for that. It cannot be just anthropic arguments or something like that, because the probability that we all emerge from a fluctuation with all our memories is of course tiny, but it's much bigger than this number. So this number seems to be so, so special that it has a physical um, explanation. Could you understand this in principle from, from quantum cosmology? So this is only a suggestion. I don't want to say that there are full-fledged calculations on it. If you look at the wheel of the Witt equation, then you see here you have the mini superspace part. Okay, I skipped the phi for simplicity and all these modes, the xn previously. You have the potential. If you look at the potential is coupled alpha and, and the x, you see that it vanishes from alpha to minus infinity. And this is a general feature having to do with the BKL oscillations and the like. So in that limit, a alpha, okay, I should say alpha is a logarithm of the scale factor, so a to zero is alpha to minus infinity. Um, so you have just uh, three, three fields, if you like. And so this is certainly compatible with this simple boundary condition that um, you, you have an unentangled initial state. Because you could have another initial state, I mean, not exactly at alpha to minus infinity, but at a whole range of the early universe. Because, yeah, if the potential is zero, then you certainly have the, pro the solution, which is a product state, which is not entangled. But if you put this in as an initial condition, then if alpha becomes bigger, Certainly, you get an increasing entanglement between all degrees of freedom. So we are at the level of the entanglement entropy, which featured also in the, in the morning talk. And so you would say, aha, uh -huh, if you have all this, you, if you calculate the entanglement entropy in the sense of trace roll or grow after integrating out, say, irrelevant degrees of freedom, then certainly this de increases with, with the scale factor, naturally. And, but it would define then the direction of time. So it would not be that, not be that the universe expanded with respect to time, but somehow entropy is bigger for a bigger universe. And this would define a standard of time. So you would get in... Uh, <laughs> I think in the most interesting moment is horrible. My train is... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, we meet anyway uh, later. So uh, yeah, yeah, we come back to that point. Okay. Actually, Klaus, did you, is this an argument or calculation in a paper of yours? Um, uh, the argument is in the paper, yeah. We, we try to, to, to return to that and to also maybe some calculations. It then, this problem ends with the unknown Hilbert space structure of, of alpha and the like. So you, the argument is simple because you get increasing entanglement, but you must also calculate numbers and um, you get naively some infinities and okay <laughs> so this is this i have not done yet but we, we actually this is uh, we, we are thinking about this further to to um regularize this and to get them num what the numbers will mean i don't know also of course you have time to make the step um, between the entang from the entanglement entropy to the thermodynamic entropy for the standard second law but this can be done. I mean, Asher Peres' book, it's nicely explained. One can use that, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So we have already some time ago, uh, this day we have discussed the error of time in a recollapsing quantum universe. At that time, recollapsing universes were more popular than today, and also they are more interesting. 
So Penrose in 1979 has made this vial tensor hypothesis that the Big Bang is very special and the Big Crunch is very generic. So here you have these stalactites, the black hole, vial tensor diverging, here vial tensor zero and so on. But I have argued earlier that um, the Big Bang and the Big Crunch are more or less the same in quantum cosmology. I mean, they are just small a, so they, are, they, they have no intrinsic definition. So if you base it on a quantum cosmology model, then of course you have this picture. Yeah, so that you have radius zero, radius zero, and you have here maximum extension, and you have here a time symmetric picture. So this gives you back the old situation discussed by Thomas Gold long ago, that you have an error of time in the sense of entanglement entropy from here to here, but also you would have it from here to here. So you would not have a classically returning universe. Whether this is true or not, this I don't know, but I would say it's a um, it's a direct consequence of the equations, if you take the equation seriously. Yeah, is it clear what I mean? Or? Are you saying there are retarded potentials on one side and advanced potentials Yeah, the right. That everything is really time symmetric? It's really time symmetric, but there's no classical connection here. There's no, so this is a quantum... Sorry, so what, what happens here is you have this expanding branches but they interfere destructively at the maximum. So entropy goes from, from small a, I mean increases, yeah, and you have many branches, and then they, there is um, destructive interference, and that's it. So you only have these branches with expanding you. Once you reach the maximum, you, I mean, you exit the classical approximation and you interfere destructively and I mean the classical world is gone. So it has, there are no paradoxes like the one discussed by Paul Davis that your classic, if you had a classical connection that you're from the other part you have advanced radiation. So in this sense it's, con it's consistent and you need this if you don't have this um, um, destructive interference otherwise you would again get exponentially uh, increasing wave functions in the classically forbidden regions which in no boundary conditions you would, you would get, but here we have just this situation with the wave packet and, and so psi goes to zero um, beyond the classical maximum of it. So I mean, The equivalence for local beings like us living near the moment sort of thing, mm -hmm. what do they experience? Oh, they would experience, actually they would, we would uh, until very close, the coherence at least in these models, <laughs> would, would be very strong enough, so we would not see much. And within a rather short time, I mean, the other, yeah, what, how this will, well, actually we would not survive as what Gelman calls IGES, information gathering and utilizing systems, because it would have interfered. This like uh, in, the, in, in the Vienna experiments, where they have the big molecules, so I think some of them speculate with making this for a virus. So, and if the virus had some rudimentary conscience, then of course it would also have destructive interference, would not survive as a classical IGUS. And also here, I mean, we, we would also come to an end. There would be some, whatever, how we experience this catastrophe, like the virus in the <laughs> Zeilinger experiment. And, and that's it. You know? and, and there would be only observers having, um, seeing an expanding universe. There can be no others, if this is correct. But do they see exactly the same universe? So we um, have only one half universe. Um, you mean, mean these other branches? Leibniz in, in this um, inability of identical. So um, identity of <laughs> I would. I think it would be the same like um, like in the quantum mechanic interference experiment. If you have say, if you can imagine um, the two vi viruses uh, separated, they they would experience more or less the same, but they would be in the in the experiment at different positions, of course. But here, I would say it would more or less. For example, if you have this component, which would be then interfering with this component. Um, it would more or less it look the same. same. It's, complex it's a complex condition. It would so be the same, like yes. Galois, it's exactly the same. It is, yeah, but you could also have other components. You could have another, I mean, you have, of course, many solutions to the hamilton Jacobi equation. So you would have a whole sum of e to the i s null k and, and so on. But this would be exactly the same, yes, <laughs> because it's just a complex conjugate. So it would mean that 
everything exists twice. No? So you talked about your counterpart no, in the morning. So yeah, there would be one counterpart of you. Okay, so the, I really are coming now to the end. So about the interpretation, I should also say almost all approaches to quantum gravity preserve the linear structure of quantum theory, also string theory, and thus the strict validity of the superposition principle and main interpretation of quantum cosmology is the Everett interpretation with the coherence as a key ingredient. Although some people discussed the De Bruyne-Bohm interpretation and um, which in my way of viewing it is not that much different from Everett because it's also linear, just to have extra structure. Yeah, De Witt in 67 wrote, Everett's view of the world is a very natural one to adopt in the quantum theory of gravity where one is accustomed to speak without embarrassment of the wave function of the universe. It is possible that Everett's view is not only natural but essential. I mean, for him, um, I think you know that this was the reason actually to adopt this interpretation because he was re arriving at that more or less independently by thinking about quantum cosmology. <coughs> and this is now really the conclusion. Um, so at the fundamental level of quantum gravity, I would say there is no need for probability interpretation since there exists neither time nor observer. So it's not clear, at least to me, what probability means without time and without observers. So they appear in the semi-classical limit and one can understand at least at a formal level. I don't want to claim that this is mathematically for the full equation on a, on a sound footing, but conceptually I would say it's clear. They appear in the semi-classical limit. Classical properties follow through the decoherence and the probability interpretation is needed only in this limit and can perhaps be described in the sense of Schurek, um, also others, David worked on that, David Deutsch, this is a separate thing one could discuss about the emergence of the probability interpretation. But my point is that if you have no time observers, then there's no probability. And that the origin of the direction of time can be understood in at least in principle. So thank you very much for your patience. I have a question about one of your slides. Can you uh, go back to the Wheeler graph? 2D. Um, Wheeler. Wheeler? Yeah. Wheeler and David. Um, yeah. Yes, of course. Here they are. So I, I'm just <laughs> going to talk about the background. About the here. blackboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have um, time in the first one and on the left. So time is a function of gravity. And um, here, I mean, what uh, here? This is um, just mechanics and quantum mechanics. It's not yet gravity. Uh, he, he, well, there, there's some missing, of course. Here, here, he comes into the Planck scale, and he explains then the differences. But I said it in words. What is? But what is your question about that? Okay. So basically, so then he quantizes mm -hmm. on the left one and says, well, time now doesn't make sense because, well, because of what he shows on, on the graph. And then you have this equation that basically you ignore time. And so, and then you go from here to, you know, to, to the cosmos and, you know, and so explaining the, the expansion and so on. And, and so all we know about cosmology and all, all the observations, everything we, we calculate is based on, you know, trajectory of, uh, of light, you know, through space, which just, which means there is some sort of a time mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and it's this WKB and, time. And so that time, the time you observe universally is, is a function of gravity of some kind. And so this gravity is a different scale than the gravity on the right and the gravity on the left. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of surprised that we can just ignore time completely and, and just go um, from a quantum... Well, level. this is, I mean, these equations, they are in a sense forced upon us by the formalism of quantization and we have to make sense out of it and the making sense out of it is uh, what I tried to discuss here when time emerges as a semi-classical time and this is the time of the Friedman equations and of the standard cosmology. So the standard cosmology with the standard time is valid as long as this approximation is valid and, and we have the coherence. 
So there are situations then where this does not hold, for example, in this expanding universes, this destructive interference, which is far away from the Planck scale. Yeah, so quantum theory is much, quantum gravity is much more general than just Planck scale physics. I mean, if you believe in the superposition principle, or say in you know, the Big Bang, when you have the singularity avoidances tied to zero, then certainly these approximations break down and you have to resort to the full equation. But this is sufficient, I mean, to do what we do in cosmology, for example, calculating the power spectrum, doing light propagation in cosmology. Or you would argue with that? Uh, it just, you know, logically, it seems to me if you can quantize uh, a particle, you can quantize time, you can definitely gravity well, change its mean, form. And so it's That's just that. logically, if, if we are working on different scales, that simply you cannot ignore time as a function of gravity. It's but just this is not a constraint. This is a Hamilton, this is a Hamilton constraint. constraint. So it's not that I chose yeah, that. Yeah, um, quantization procedure. You actually have to. There is a procedure yeah. called quantization procedure. And Dirac actually formalized this. Yeah. this is, if you follow the Dirac formalization, then you have to have this equation. Mm -hmm. This is this is Hamiltonian constraint without any evolution. There is no time. That's a mean There is anyway no time to quantize. Well, that's my argument. That yeah, there is no time. Yes, there is no time. External time exists in the equations. <laughs> this is a mathematical. Okay? And it has a physical explanation as uh, Wheeler. And if, if you perhaps like, it's still nice to read the Battelle Rencontre lectures of John Wheeler of 1968, um, where you dynamics. yeah the geometrodynamics very in detail, and yeah, there there's also. Yeah, he wrote a book in German also about that, but the, the English is in the Battelle Rencontre. And uh, this is, uh, uh, where he explains these features and how this comes. The Witt's article is of course a milestone, um, but it's very technical also. But I, I, I can certainly also discuss more. I can understand the technicalities. Yeah, yeah, but Richard John Wheeler, Richard John Wheeler, you will understand. Okay. I do not know who was next you. Uh, uh, German did not look. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there was Ted and, and, and this lady first, maybe. I'm first, okay. Uh, 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 thank you. That's great because I, I, I wanted just to continue on this topic. Uh, so I don't understand a uh, constraint it, uh, in Hamiltonian formalism, it should be like an analog of symmetries. Uh, uh, the Lagrangian formalism and the idea, I think you have mentioned that uh, we want this to be um, invariant on the uh, infinitesimal space time transformation. Yeah, but this is what this um, second. So you have actually four constraints, four local yeah. constraints. So, so pl classically, 10 of the Einstein equations are constraints, yes. yeah, which are just the conditions on initial value data without time evolution. This is the one Hamiltonian constraint and the three momentum constraint. And this, the interpretation of this, this looks simpler. You can show that if you make an infinitesimal coordinate transformation of the three metric, that psi remains invariant. Perhaps you know um, Gauss law ne, in uh, um, among the Maxwell equation, Nabla E is zero. And if you quantize it, then the E goes to d psi over dA. And this analog equation would mean that psi is invariant under gauge transformations. I just don't understand if you uh, have in your transformation, if you have, uh, I mean, you should have time there because the transformation acts on time. Yeah, this so is the first one. Have it's it? invariance under time diffeomorphism. Yes, yeah, so you should have an expression, That's you should essential. have time in uh, your expression which says uh, uh, my equation should be invariant under time. So why does not uh, time then appear in the equation itself? Um, and what you, is, is what you mean the following, that you first say you want h psi is i psi dot, but because you have the constraint, you have, you concluded psi dot is zero. Uh, uh, this is actually what Bergman wrote down <laughs> ne, in, in the 60s. So he said, okay, I want to have h psi is, is i psi dot, but then you have the constraint, this is why psi dot is zero. Which yes, is another so way of saying so that... You have time at the moment when you impose the constraint, because otherwise you don't have anything to act on. Um, I mean, yeah. when you have this, these are exact equations from general relativity. And, and, and so all the information about the quantum theory is in this equation. And, 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 uh, and, and 
to wonder about the absence of time would also be, say, like in quantum mechanics, to wonder about absence of electron trajectories, <coughs> which people have wondered in the very early day, of course. But I think we, we know that there are no electrons not on a trajectory. It looks like you're still you're first acting on time to say uh, uh, my equation should be invariant on the time, and then you say, okay, if it is invariant, then I can forget about time. Uh, no, I, what I say is there is no time, no? because space-time is no longer existent, like the trajectory is not existent. Each dot doesn't exist. Means each, in physical metric, each dot, means if I have a time, each dot doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is not this yeah. Yeah, there is no T here. There is no T, yeah. there, there there is no T no, here. It comes from the Lagrangian. If you the full Lagrangian, if you write them, and if you find this time, like the time components means, if you like to compute, it's undefined. You can't compute. It's in the Dewey paper. Here. No, but you are confused by changing time means you, you move the slice of space time. Mm -hmm. You have to slice it by something yeah, and, and you can move it. it. <laughs> I think I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there is a subtlety here. Um, so this is working in a canonical formalism. In the canonical formalism, instead of having a picture of space time, you have a picture of trajectories of your configuration and momenta. Mm -hmm. The bottom uh, three constraints there, the metric here, the spatial metric depends explicitly on spatial coordinates and the, the bottom three constraints here are just saying that when you change a spatial coordinate infinitesimally, the wave function remains invariant. Mm -hmm. The top constraint is, the Hamiltonian constraint is supposed to be the equivalent of saying that if you change time infinitesimally and look at the corresponding change in the metric, that the wave function is invariant under those changes. But because it's working in a canonical formalism, uh, that is technically only true up to equations of motion. So what it says is that, what that constraint says is that if you have your wave function as a function of your metric, uh, you change the metric infinitesimally by shifting your time coordinate. And then you translate that change in the metric back into just a change in the functional form that the wave function is invariant under that particular kind of change in the functional form. And so in that sense it is saying that you have invariance under changes in your time coordinate in the same sense that you have invariance under changes in your spatial coordinates. And that's why the time coordinate doesn't appear anymore. It's because if if you're defining time as the t in your in your metric, and you want to say, well, what is if you know the wave function at t equals zero, what is the wave function at t equals one? I can say that's just a coordinate transformation. I'm just changing from t to t plus one. So that kind of time translation doesn't show, can't be there, and that that picture of time evolution as evolution in terms of some coordinate can't be there because the coordinates don't have any real meaning. So you have to go back in and figure out, well, what do you mean by time then? And that's hard. In this case, this is using the uh, in this model, it's using the size of an expanding universe as a measure of, of time. Yeah, so, thank you. I think uh, partially it explains the question. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for this. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was very intrigued at your statement that um, until time, into, except in conditions where time becomes well defined, you don't need probability. So apparently your view on this whole formalism is that we have a quantum gravity, uh, I don't know if I should call it a theory or a formalism, but 
is what I want to get, what I want to ask you about. We have some formalism, which in some special uh, subset of configurations or wave functions requires an interpretation in terms of probability and time. So my question is, what do you make of it when you're not in that situation? Does it have no interpretation? Is it physics? Is it saying something about the world? Or is its only applicability or meaning to the extent that you can make, that time has emerged and you have defined probabilities? Um, I would say that it also in the timeless situation makes statements about the okay, world. Okay, so but what are those statements? Um, I, yeah, I for see example, that in this, mathematical you know, statements, but what do they mean physically? Um, as you know, of course, I also have not a final in, uh, um, theory, a final interpretation, but I can interpret this formalism as far as it has been developed. And yeah, first, as you said, in the semi-classical regime, I recover the standard quantum mechanics. And uh, I can go beyond that, for example, calculating this quantum gravitational correction term, so that um, if, if, if the full Wheeler David equation uh, uh, did not hold, then of course, so such terms would not emerge. Yeah. But are you going to assign a probability to a certain value of that term? Um, well, this is at the at a, a level still of the corrected Schrödinger equation. So you have i psi dot is, is yeah, so h psi plus plus such a term, and so I can treat it at the level of standard quantum theory, but with a correction that has one over Planck mass square. Okay, so this so would be if if this were measured, then I would in exactly like that. <coughs> then I would say, in spite of having no access to the full maybe Wheeler David equation, this equation has some correct features. Anyway, I would not think that it, this equation is exact because it has no unification of forces. So fundamentally, perhaps you should have something oh, but, like okay, string theory. Now first you dodge the question this way, and now you're dodging it. Ah, no, okay. No, I mean, my answer, I think my answer was clear, so that that it no, makes, makes sense even, you know. Uh, Let me clarify the question. Okay. Because, so suppose we had the unification of forces, mm -hmm. and we redid the whole thing mm -hmm. the whole okay. time with the right theory. Mm -hmm. Still, we would be in a position with no probability and no time yes. for a certain big sector. Right. Of yes, this yes, 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 no answers, yes. Mm -hmm. I want to know does that theory have a meaning yes. beyond the framework where you can talk about probability and time? And then my clear answer is yes. Well, I don't see that you've explained it. You have an <laughs> example where you do have time and probability, and then it's just yeah. a refinement of that regime. Um, but you haven't told me about the regime where there's no time and yeah, no problem. Yeah, because otherwise people were even more angry with me to, to speak even more longer than I do. I mean, I have focused on this issue with um, decoherence mainly, and that, and I have certainly not discussed other, other issues. But um, I, w I, w I would definitely say, yes, that this is also makes sense beyond that. For example, when you discuss singularity avoidance, then this is in a region where this semi-classical approximation breaks down and where you can discuss um, which solutions, say, lead to singularity ones, which not. And uh, given certain solutions of the wheeler david equation, one can have also in the semi-classical regime maybe certain traces. But this would you give a probability to the singularity being avoided? Would you assign a probability to that? But there is no observable. And what are you saying about it? That's exactly what I'm trying to get at. Does the theory make any statements about anything? I would say beyond that, probability um, interpretation. I would say yes. For example, if I really understood this equation fully and I find that necessarily psi is zero at the regions uh, where where there is uh, classical singularity, and of course. Okay. And um, then I, 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 that probability, you would say, and I again make probability statements because no, psi I equals like zero makes makes saying... makes zero probability. But right. in this sense, yes, I would say, if and you may say what's forbidden without saying assigning probabilities to other things. Yeah. Okay. That's at this heuristic point. level, yes, I would say yes. I, I actually I followed a bit in this, um, in this respect, what you did in '67, so that <coughs> in the, that that. Psi equals zero there means that this is forbidden. Or, or, or otherwise, no, token. No, you, huh? you have it has to be consistent. You, either you impose psi equals zero or you show it's consistent with the evolution, with the will of the will. You mean that for, for non vanishing psi? It's a postulate. 
Yeah, but I mean, you can, for example, you can also have then the fact, I mean, the classical singularity theorems apply. I mean, if you have in incomplete geodesics, say, and if you have a wave packet that necessarily, even beyond the semi classical limit, just fades away and is not there, then, or in other cases, we have shown that as a necessary spreading of the wave pack, then we have just ended with the classical evolution before that. And this would also be a prediction that you would end with the, with the classical world before you come to these would-be singularities. Yeah, okay. another, another, thing, another thing is when you ask, and so uh, you allow us the answer, is that um, you can also apply the Wheeler-DeWitt equation to non-cosmological situation, for example, to a quantum black hole. Then you have the quantum black hole, is, well, this is also when you use that in your arguments, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, but the, the quantum black hole is, say, in a semi-classical universe. So you can use the semi-classical time outside, but you have the full Wheeler-DeWitt equation for the quantum black hole, which in principle can, can um, explore and has in principle meaning. Yeah. So you can, when we have some years ago, a very, started a very simplified model for that to see what would happen if we could solve the wheeler dewitt equation for a quantum black hole in spite of the formal limitations and then you get results such as that at the end you have a quantum state where you cannot distinguish between Hawking radiation and the black hole and that. So this would also be a situation where the equation beyond the semi-classical limit could be tested. But I admit, of course, that so far, I mean, most, I mean, this, uh, um, most applications are in this regime where you have a semi-classical approximation. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying it to criticize. No, 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 no. I mean, I there is the fact that uh, I, I, I myself want to understand this. So, if you, <laughs> if you like me, are very troubled by the role of probability in the foundations of physics. Yeah, so I'm I. Quantum <laughs> mechanics. Uh, this is what you basically just suggested: is that the Wheeler-DeWitt equation could that the core or the root of probability is just maybe statements about what is forbidden and what is allowed. Yes, yes. And then there's a kind of refinement that emerges only in certain special conditions when you can assign probability, but you don't have nothing without probability. At least you have some, some specification of allowed and forbidden. Maybe that's the route that you could yeah, take to. Yeah, I mean, for me, certainly probabilities are emergent in some way. So even without going to quantum cosmology, if you discuss quantum mechanics, and if you take the average picture seriously, uh, like in these papers with Zurich and David and Deutsch, then of course there are also no probabilities because all the branches are there, right? So what does it mean, probabilities? And you can then try to define um, what are relative frequencies. You just count the branches, how many uh, realizations you have, and you could try to interpret this as probability. There's a lot this a deep discussion about that and criticism also of Zurich's paper. But I would say in principle, this is how it should go. This is just the consistency of the formalism with our language of probabilities. I mean, more perhaps you will not get out, I don't know. As that. But probabilities, I, if you have the same opinion, I, I, I would say they are not fundamental and should not play a fundamental role in any theory, quantum or classical. Since you just mentioned those authors, I want to advertise to everybody who might be interested. Another source for, uh, two sources for arguments that derive in that sense probability that precede all the ones you mentioned. Uh -huh. One actually, probably most people know, but I didn't know, it's actually Everett's original article yes. has a derivation yes. of this nature. Of and, and secondly, there's a fantastically nice one by a totally unknown, brilliant person who passed away recently named Elihu Lubkin, or Lupkin. Lupkin. Mm -hmm. He derived the probability interpretation from entanglement. Ah, oh, I, I, I would like to, I mean this is, here, no? Which is very similar Lupkin. to yeah. Zurich. Uh, but it's much older, you it's say. It's much older, yeah. And not cited in Zurich's paper? Well, or? it's funny you mention that. I looked around and Google Scholar and Spires and everywhere I could look, and I found a ghost citation of uh, Lupkin by Zurich. A ghost citation? Yes, one what of Zurich's that? publications was listed as having cited uh. Lupkin's paper. But then I looked in all of Zurich's publications 
and none of them cite Lupkin's paper. <laughs> but this is maybe a quantum effect. <laughs> <laughs> Actual citation. Uh huh. But uh -huh. but how did you find this uh, then? Uh, Lupkin's paper I found because I've been a fan of Lupkin uh -huh. for many years. I think I actually was literally just um, looking at a list of his publications and I came across it. I think that's how I found yeah, it. I, will, I will, would be happy to have this reference, but yeah. yeah I'd be very happy. But I think this, uh, at the end, I think this is about all we can have, like Zurich or this or Deutsch's picture of a consistency of our words, probability with this fundamental quantum framework. Steve, that will be the last question. <laughs> okay, so maybe this is slightly technical for a last question, uh, but it's about the nature of time, so I think it is allowed. Uh, in your final arguments about the time symmetry and Big Bang being Big Crunch, those arguments seem to rely very heavily on your choice of the scale factor as your time variable. Have you looked at what, hap what would happen if, for instance, uh, you chose extrinsic time, York, York time, mm -hmm. as your time variable? Because there you have a difference in sign between the expansion and contraction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not so obvious there's a symmetry seems to me that's a good example of the problem of time, where you pick mm -hmm. two different physical observables to be time, you looks like you might get very different answers. Yeah, I have not discussed this in the extrinsic representation, so what Steve was asking, when, like in quantum mechanics, you can have X representation or P representation. And what I discussed here is the equivalent of the X representation. But you could also do something analogous to the P representation using the trace of the extrinsic curvature, which is somehow <coughs> conjugated to the scale factor, which I have not discussed here. Yeah, so um, I cannot, well, there, there are people who have discussed this. I have not discussed this because, as far as I know, for the full wheel of equation, this transformation is not clear from, from the X to the P that does not exist, exist perhaps. So, that I have committed myself to have this as a more fundamental, but I'm of course open to this, and, but I'm sorry I cannot answer okay. what happens for the K representation. It would be fun to know. Yes, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. I will keep this in, in, in my mind. I think there's a very old paper by Cardia and Wheeler mm -hmm. where they discuss cosmology in the K representation, I think 1979 or something like that. I have to check this. Thank you. Okay.